chapter 4. Amen. We'll read a little bit. And then after that, I'll get a little bit more on Exodus chapter 4, verses 4. And we'll read all the way to uh, 7. Exodus chapter 4, 4 through 7. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? The staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your, their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside of your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. He had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. And so Moses put his hand back into his cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful, Lord Jesus. We sense your presence this morning. You have taught us, Lord, countless times that you inhabit the praises of your people. And we truly give glory to your name, Lord. And Father, we are a people of the need, Lord Jesus. We come into the household of faith, Lord, to worship you and in spirit and in truth. We come here to seek a word of wisdom from you, Lord. We come, Lord Jesus, knowing for as you have taught us, without you we are nothing. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will uh, touch the hearts of all men and women and children alike, Lord. We need you, Lord Jesus. Father, sometimes, uh, whether it be a day, a week, or a month, or even a year, Lord, we seek out refuge in you, Lord, for you are our strength and our fortress. So, Father, I pray right now as you hide me behind your precious cross, I pray, Lord Jesus, as you will teach us, Lord. Sometimes, Lord, we do need signs and confirmation, Lord. Things, Lord Jesus, that enable us to go on. Father, we pray, Lord Jesus, as you will teach us your ways this morning. Father, as we become stronger and stronger in our faith. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. This is a wonderful story. Uh, Moses is uh, uh, tending his sheep uh, and the sheep of Jethro. And of course, that's his father-in-law. Along the way, he happens upon a, a bush, if you will, a bush that is consumed by fire. And this is his personal encounter with the Almighty God. And as he's encountering God, God speaks to him. And when he speaks to Moses, he tells Moses, and makes a long story short, short, he speaks to Moses and he tells Moses, I've heard the cries of my people. And he knows about the oppression of the uh, Egyptians. And he tells Moses that I'm going to send you. You're going to be my deliverer. You're going to be the, my man to go and speak to Pharaoh. And of course, God knows because God is omniscient. He knows Moses' thoughts before even Moses thinks about this. And Moses is already feeling inadequate about the job, the task at hand. He's thinking, who am I? Who am I? Should I speak to even Pharaoh? But the thing is, he's even concerned, who am I to even speak to my own people? In fact, I'm just still brand new. In fact, I'm nobody. Who are they? Why would they even listen to me? And of course, this is the little narrative or story that we come upon where Moses is actually speaking to God. And God tells Moses in this wonderful story, he tells him, I'm going to show you some signs. Some signs of how these people, my chosen people, will listen to you. But the first, God has to speak to Moses' heart. And, and I think this is important when we think about these signs to, to enable us to get strong in our faith. Now, again, you would think that all I really need to do is have faith in God. You know, uh, some of us, myself included, 
for you, if you were that individual that just for some apparent reason, you know, you were living life and somebody shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with you and you did not need a sign, if that was you, that's wonderful. I think that's great, for, but for many of us, many of us came to Jesus Christ because of a sign. Amen. And that, see, that's the thing, when I think about this sign, you know, it, it was either something happening, whether it be a relationship in your family, something personal in your own intimate life, somehow maybe you were down in the gutter, maybe something you happened to do in life that you struggled with, Somehow, some way, God gave you a sign to catch your attention. And see, that's the thing is, these signs that God uh, literally shows us to, to capture our attention are, are a wondrous thing. And you know, these aren't signs too like uh, your, your typical sign that you will see on the freeway or on the streets that give you some kind of guidance or direction. These are signs to bring the word confirmation. To, to tell you, you know what, something is different in your life and God is trying to tell you, I'm showing you this so that you will believe. One of my favorite stories, because I just want to reference the story when you think about signs, is Gideon. And in Gideon chapter 6, Gideon was a, a wonderful judge himself. And his story is no different than, than Moses's, but tweaked a little bit, if I will. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, because I, I kind of want to preface this before I get into the, my points, because you need to understand that God has a great sense of humor. And when it comes to signs, God is long-suffering. He's very patient with us because we're people that want confirmation. And Gideon had already a mass army of 10,000. And of course, we know that the Midianites were kind of com coming together and they were, their strength and number was coming together. But, but Gideon was okay. He was saying, okay, my tens of thousands against them, we, we have them. But God wanted to remind Gideon, it's not your army and it's not you that is going to gain the glory. When we win, and this is God saying this to Gideon, when we win, it's not going to be about you. It's going to be about me. Amen. Nobody takes my glory. So then uh, here was Gideon thinking about, well, I know we can do it, but what, what we have. So God pretty much dwindled, if you will, his army. And of course, he told him, I want you to tell the guys and stand up before them. If there's anybody here that doesn't want to be part of this body, go ahead and go home. Of course, Gideon was thinking there would be a lot of guys that would stand with them, but a lot of guys left. They left. I got things I got to do home. I got, you know, I want to be with my wife and my kids. There was a mass exodus of guys that left. So, of course, you know, here was Gideon thinking, okay, then, of course, God wasn't through yet. Because Gideon, after the, the guys left, he said, well, we still got a great number of guys, and I'm paraphrasing. We still got a number, and I know that we can still win with the fighting force that we have. And so God went along and said, nope, they're still too big. So God told him to do something else. God told him to take these individuals down to the watering hole, and what I want you to do is make these individuals get something to drink. Well, in the story, he, he watched these men. He says, go down to the watering hole, and whoever chooses to take the water with their hand, you've been to a watering hole, you take the water with your hand, you cup your hands together and you drink, right? Yeah. Well, some chose to go like this and others chose to stick their mouth in there and lap it like an animal, right? And God used that as a tool, if you will, and said, the ones that cup it with their hand, those are the ones that are gonna use the fight. And that's how he, he did it. And of course, now it came down to where there was hardly any men. And there was a just, and it's a great movie, I think it's, there's a movie that we watch on TV, and that we're thinking, there were only 300. And that kind, of, that kind of been scary for me. If I were getting, I'd go, I had tens of thousands, and now I'm down to a, a measly 300 men? Are you kidding me, God? But God told him, I will give the Midianites into your hands. And here's the story that I want to share with you about Gideon asking for a sign. And we're all like this when it comes to sign. So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you promised, 
Look, I will place a fleece, a wolf fleece, on the threshing floor, and if there's dew on it, on the fleece, and, and the ground is dry, then I will know that you, you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose there early the next morning, and as he took the fleece and he wrung it out, a, a bowl full of water uh, came off. But then look at what Gideon does. A wonderful thing about signs. Verse 39, then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. But this time, make the fleece dry and let the ground be covered with dew. And that night God did so. Only the fleece was dry and the ground was covered with dew. So here's a great thing. There was a sign that was given to Gideon. Kind of indicating to Gideon, this is how you know you're going to have victory. That I'm going to hand the Midianites into your hands. It's not about how many men you're going to have. It's about that you can depend on me. I am reliable. And these signs that I will give you to bring confirmation so that your faith will be strengthened. Amen? And so this is kind of when we read a little bit about the Bible, we see that there is confirmation after confirmation after confirmation that God is dependable, that God is reliable, that God will always be there and come through for his people at any given circumstance. Amen? You guys awake? Okay. Signs of faith. Don't worry about the kid. We need a little activity in here. <laughs> Baby's praising God. It says, signs of faith. And this is Moses. Moses answered. I love this response because, of course, he's feeling inadequate. What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord didn't appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Of course, Moses had a staff. Moses was a shepherd. And because he was shepherd, shepherds used this tool as an instrument to guide their flock. And the shepherd's staff, if you will, he used it to do various things with his flock, to, to prod his sheep and put him in, in the, the right direction or everything else. But God, you need to grab hold of this, God uses various things to be instruments of our faith. And this was a, a sign for, for his faith. Now what do I mean by that? That God uses various things to be instruments of our faith. Just like Moses, one of the greatest stories that I, I love is where God allowed the disciples to feed the multitudes with the, with the bread or the loaves. When God took the, the loaves, he extended it to the air uh, and he gave thanks to God for the loaves. And then he told the disciples, now distribute the loaves to the people so they can eat. This is the miraculous thing. They were still the same loaves. And as the disciples began to distribute each part of the loaves, they would give the loaves to the people, and each time they broke off a piece of the loaf, the miraculous took place in the hands of the disciples. And see, this is the wonderful thing. God used the disciples, and the sign of the miraculous took place in the hands of man. It's the same way when God says, what's in your hand? Some people don't grab hold of this, and I want you to understand this. Sickness in the lives of people can be used as an instrument to bring God glory. It could be a sign to encourage the body of believers. And how do I, what do I mean by that? If you are afflicted with a disease and you're saying, well, how can this be? This is disastrous. But it's about an attitude. It's about a faith in knowing that sometimes even sickness, God can use that as a sign to strengthen your faith. And that's why for you that are afflicted and you're saying, what was me? Why did God do this to me? And I know that, again, I know that could be something very common. People have a tendency to do that. But when you are in Christ Jesus and you trust that God is in control, meaning he's sovereign, that you trust in who holds tomorrow, and you know that God can heal you of all your diseases, and you believe the scripture that by you his stripes you are healed. Yes. If you hold on to these personal truths, that God can use even sickness to be glorified in your life. God can use even that. One of the other things I, I've noticed that God can even use your money, your finances. 
Oh, Pastor Ben, you're digging into the finances now. <laughs> you know, it's an amazing thing. In the body of Christ, when you're brand new to the faith, you start coming to church, and you think, oh, there they go, taking an offering again. Oh, there they go, they want, one of my, they want my money again. But this is about God saying to you, I don't need your money. It's about character building. It's about strengthening your faith. Learning to trust God even with your treasure. And some of us don't get this. We hoard. We hoard our wallets and we say, I may not have enough. I may not have enough. It's about faith. It's about saying to God, I'm going to be able to give, Lord, and trust that you're the God, as a brother quoted, Brother Jesse, I know that, God, you will provide all my needs according to your riches and glory. Amen. When you believe that promise, then this wallet becomes an open wallet because you have learned by faith that God is provider. And when you allow your wallet to be a sign to strengthen your faith, when somebody is in need, it could be a missionary, and you say to yourself, well, I don't know if I'll be able to meet ends meet with, with what I give. And if I even give a portion of that, cheerfully I give a portion of that, I don't know if I'll be able to meet tomorrow. <coughs> this is between you and God. And I'm reminding you, it's always between you and God. Don't let myself, don't let the speaker influence you. It's between you and God. And you know, faith has to deal with you learning to trust God, even with your finances. God allows these things to take place in your life, so to strengthen your faith. Now think about it. If you had $100 in your pocket and you know more money is coming, then it's not faith. Because you're saying, well, I could give up my wealth to the missionary. You say, I could give $100. It hasn't taxed you. It hasn't done anything to you. You don't get stronger in your faith knowing that you can depend on the resources that you have. But if you only have that which you have, and it's $100, and you say, Lord, I want to be able to provide for your work, but I only can give half, that's an act of faith. And it's through these signs, whether it be your finances, that God sees that in your heart. And God sees that because it is in that act of faith that God uses even those little things in our life to strengthen our faith. Amen? One more. Time. <laughs> time. Time is the... You're not going to get more time. i got to pick on my wife. She's a birthday girl. And when you think about birthdays, you think about... You know, time. Time passes, right? I mean, think about this. Didn't we just celebrate the new year? Uh, didn't you hear that? We just celebrated the new year, and it's already October. Wow, time flies, doesn't it? That's why I kind of, you know, we always recall, you can tell you're older because when you're older, you're always thinking about what it used to be like. So this is kind of categorizes everybody here. If you always think about the way it used to be, you're older. If you're always thinking about when you're going to get something, when I get my driver's license, when I turn 21, can't wait till I finish college, you're starting to think in the future, then you're younger. So you know that there's two categories. You're either older or younger. There's no in between, okay? So think about this. God uses these various things. And I, I want you to understand these signs of faith. And one of the things, I, uh, one of the scriptures I want to show you is in John chapter 2. John chapter 2. This is how we know God operates with signs. And it says, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw signs. He was performing and believed in his name. These signs accompanied Jesus. Jesus, whenever he did any of the things that were miraculous, they accompanied him. And the Bible tells us that while he was performing these, many individuals came to the belief in him. And it's just, again, I'm, I recall this, this verse because 
I'm reminded about testimonies. I'm reminded that when people share what Jesus Christ has done in their life, it makes you as an individual say, if God can do that for you, then maybe he could do it for me. Notice I said maybe, because you don't know what God is capable of. When you are brand new to the faith, you don't know if God could be depended on. But when you see it in the lives of somebody else, that's tangible. That's saying you see it in their lives. And the God they profess to believe in has done it for them. Then you begin to say, if they did it for them, then maybe he could do it for me. That's how you come to believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Amen? One more verse. Luke chapter 21 is one of my uh, favorites. talks about... Um, what? Christmas time. It's Christmas time. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, Bethlehem, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. Everybody say sign. sign. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in the manger. So here we're, who is this to? This word to the angels. Angels speaking to shepherds. They told them, this will be a sign to you. This is your direction. This is your confirmation that when you go into Bethlehem and you see a baby, the shepherds knew babies aren't in a manger. They're usually in houses. And when they came upon the manger and they saw the baby, the Bible says they bowed down and worshipped him. And when they saw this thing that that the angels spoke about, they couldn't keep it to themselves. And what did they do? They went into the countryside proclaiming the glory of God. Amen? So these are signs that God wants us to understand. One of my other ones that I want to share with you is that's the birth of Jesus. This is what God plans to do. It's a sign to us that are still here. It says in Luke chapter 1, 21, it says, There will be great earthquakes. Famines, droughts, pestilence in various places, and fearful events, and great signs from heaven. Great signs. Think, we're, in the, we're living in a time right now where if you're not in the faith, you think about these, and all you think about is there's a lot of disasters going on in the world. And the world gets kind of kind of scared. The world says, you know, the Middle East is in an uproar. We have all this famine. There's a lot of homeless people. You know, we're all, all the world sees this, and let's make that intimate. We look around Stockton, and we see signs. I've never seen this before. I'm starting to see it now. Every time I drive now, there's a sign that says, no panhandling. I see that before. I said, where did that come from? It's a response to all the people that are on the streets asking for a handout. But it's a reminder to us because it's a constant reminder that the world is changing. And more people are in need, whether in need of food, of the jobs, or relationship, but mostly they're in need of a savior. Mm -hmm. Let me get that church. And as we look upon verse I mean, I'm sorry, chapter 21 of verse 11, great signs from heaven. These are some of the signs that we as people of God need to grab hold of because these things are taking place right now, in the here and now. And none of us likes to see these things because we look upon them and sometimes we get kind of fearful. As a, Pastor Francis, she was praying, and for those of us that are in the medical field, we think about these such things and we think, is this something that we should be worried about? Remember the HIV virus? Yes. Everybody got really afraid of it. But somehow, knowledge teaches us that we don't have to be afraid of it. And it's the same way with Ebola. It's the same one. We, something took place and everybody gets scared and there's a knee-jerk reaction and everybody's saying, don't go to Dallas. <laughs> Think about that. Everybody's afraid because it landed there, so it must be there. And if you go there, even if you're in proximity of it, 
Because we don't know. And when you don't know, the unknown makes you fearful. Knowledge has a way of conquering fear. And it's the same way, church. God reminds us as people of God in, in chapter 21, Luke, when you see these great signs, don't be afraid. That means we are closer now to our salvation than when we first came to know. Amen? Oh, come on, church. It's important for us to understand. God tells us that don't be troubled. When you begin to see all these signs and you begin to wonder, what is happening? Why is all this calamity? Why all this destruction? Why all these bad things happening in the world? For those of us in Christ Jesus, are we, are we sick people to say, wow, that's great. No. It is a constant reminder to us that we know that the sinful world is doing what it's supposed to do. That our Lord is coming for his church. It's a reminder to us. We can do everything we can try to do. Whether it's through political battles or social issues. We do the things that we're supposed to do as Christians, as believers of the faith. But knowing that one day soon, all this stuff that God has taught us through the various signs, God is preparing for his church. Yeah. And we should not be caught by surprise. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that for the first time in Hollywood, California, that they're allowing a lot of these religious films to take hold of Hollywood when before they would say this to us. You can't bring that in here. They would stop anything religious from coming into Hollywood, but all of a sudden, these so-called actors are playing roles in the faith. And it's a reminder to us, when those things happen, right away Christians begin to think, hey, make, we're making headway. Maybe there will be peace in the Middle East. When there is finally peace in the Middle East, then destruction. Isn't that wonderful? Everybody goes, Pastor, then you're sick. It's something to think about. Because this is what God reminds us as Christians. Then again, if you don't know and you don't read your Bible, you're over there as an individual. Oh, things are getting better. There's no more murders in the schools. We get to do this. We get to do that. Life is so good. And if you don't read your Bibles, that is the time for you as a Christian be looking intently into the sky. Because that's when the Lord of God will come for his church. You gotta remind yourself of that because God tells us this. I thought this was a, a cute story. A flight attendant spent a week's vacation in the Rockies. She was captivated by the mountain peaks and the clear blue skies and the sweet smelling pines. But she also was charmed by a very eligible bachelor who owned and operated a cattle ranch and lived in a log cabin. At the end of this week, Mr. Wonderful proposed. But he had, but it all happened so quickly and the woman decided to return home to her job, feeling that she would somehow be guided to make the right decision. The next day, in flight, she found herself wondering what to do. To perk up, she stopped in the restroom and splashed cold water on her face. There was some turbulence, and a sign in the restroom lit up. Please return to your cabin. She did, to the cabin back in the mountains. I thought that was a cute thing about signs. Some of you that aren't laughing, you'll get it when you're going home. Or you'll get it a week from now. Oh, cabin, cabin. All of us kind of live and breathe on signs. Signs are great things. and Signs are things that God allows us sometimes to, he kind of gives us glimpses so that our, our faith can be stronger, amen? Kind of spoke on this point, but I want to bring to it uh, again because this is one of our tenets. Signs of healings. Now, think about this. Now put it back in your cloak, and he said to Moses, put, put the hand back into his, his jacket or his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. 
I love the word restoration. I love the word restore. It tells me that there is a God. It reminds me that God is truly in control. It tells me that no matter how difficult the task, no matter how much storms, no matter how many battles that you endure, that God has the final say. And when we think about the word restore or restoration, that is a godly, if you will, that's a godly word because the devil brings destruction. The devil brings death. And we know that our God is a God of restoration, amen? And when we think about restoration, we think about healing. And God loves to heal people. God loves to heal us of our diseases. God loves to take on various, whether it could be mindful things or physical illnesses or various relational problems, God restores all things. I was thinking about this as I was kind of putting this together. And I was kind of struggling with the passage because I asked myself this question. It says in verse 5, I'm sorry, not verse 5. Bear with me here. You know, when he goes through all this, he says, as he's telling Moses about reaching your hand and grabbing the stick or the staff, and it's, this is the first sign, and then, of course, the next one, we just read about the leprosy. This, he said to the Lord, so that they may believe that the Lord their God, the fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to you. These signs. You know, I was, I was struggling with the fact that what was God trying to show Moses when it comes to those signs? The signs of the staff turning to a snake, and the signs of Moses sticking his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, what did that mean? What does the signs of healing mean to us and to Moses himself? Moses knowing that he has to be, he's called to be the deliverer of Israel. What does that mean? And God kind of showed me this, these two signs because there was a third sign. The third sign was for the people that he was going to address when the water was going to turn to blood. That was for the people of Israel and the people that were oppressing them to see. What were the first two signs about? And God kind of spoke to me and said they were exclusively for Moses. God was reminding Moses signs and healings that God had the resources to deliver on his promises. Moses needed to understand that this needed to be something that Moses needed to embrace. And this is the same way with us as people of God. It needs to be personal with you. When it, comes, when it talks about signs and healings, it needs to be personal. Because many of us in the church, when somebody is afflicted with a disease, and we see that God can take that sickness, and that sickness is truly restored, we say to ourselves, I think that's great. That's wonderful. We clap for them. We're, we're so happy. Somebody testifies and say, you know what, I had this. Think about that. But what it's you. Think about that. When you are afflicted, when you're the one going through the problems in the situation, going to the doctor, having all the tests, test after test after test, and you know that the body of Christ is praying for you, when it's somebody else, you clap for them. I'm not taking away anything from that. But when it's you, you're the one that has to endure it. You're the one that has to trust God. You're the one that has to trust that the people or the saints of God are praying for you, encouraging you in the faith, knowing that no matter what you're going through, that God will answer your prayers. And when he does, that's why I say this was personal between God and Moses. And Moses needed to know that God was dependable. That God had a vast amount of resources to come through whenever Moses needed it. Yes. And it's the same way with us, church. Yes. We need to trust God on a personal level. Not when Sister Sue has an affliction and say, the God that I believe came through for Sister Sue. Or Brother Joe. When, when Brother Joe needed something, the God that we believe in came forth for Brother Joe. 
You need to come to the conclusion that when you need something, the same God that they believe in will come through for you too. Because that's who God is. It's not about Sue or Joe. It's about you. And God was showing Moses the same thing. I will be there for you, Moses. I will be your deliverer. Not just the people of Israel. I will be there for you. I will help you when you encounter difficult times. I have the resources and the power and the strength to deliver even you, the problems you are associated with. Signs of healing. And this is on a personal level for all of us, church. Again, we always clap when other people find victory in Jesus. But when it finally happens to you, can you believe the God that came for Brother Joe and Sister Sue is the same God that's going to come through for you? Amen? Amen? Amen. Yes. That's how God is. Because God does not love them more than you. God loves all of us. And because he loves all of us, he doesn't want any of his individuals, any of his people to have to endure what we're enduring. And that's a wonderful thing when I think about healings. So, you know, the more I think about this and I said, God, why didn't you just spell it out like that? Why didn't you just say that these two signs were strictly for him? And God made me dig and dig and dig and dig. And in my prayer, I said, God, what does this mean? It's for me. It's for you. It's personal. And God is trying to tell us our personal needs come from the Almighty. Amen? Amen? We may see it in others, and we may see it in a nation, but God is a personal God. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. Come on, let's give God glory. Amen. I'm reminded of, of the authority that God has, and of course I share the story in Matthew, I'm sorry, it's not in Matthew, but it's about the centurion. And the centurion, when he had his servant, it was very ill. And I'm, I'm reminded when we think about God's healing power, the centurion came and he spoke to the Lord. And he told him, I am not worthy. I am not worthy that you would come under my roof to heal my servant. But the greatest words that Jesus Christ ever said, and in fact, he's memorialized throughout the, uh, the, the good news. Jesus said of the centurion, I have not seen this type of faith throughout all Israel. The, this, this centurion who's, if you're trying to figure out what a centurion, a centurion is like a general. He's the guy that has control of everybody in the military. And when the centurion says to one individual, take that hill, they don't say how we're going to take it, they just take it. They don't ask how or how fast we're supposed to run, they just take it because he told them to do it. And he believes in his heart that they're going to do it. And he understands that concept of authority. And when he went to Jesus, knowing that he probably had seen the wonders, the signs and wonders that followed Jesus, he comes to Jesus very humbly. My servant is very ill. But just say the word, and I know that it will take place. Isn't that powerful? And that's the same way God wants with us. You know, that's why I love when we talk about healing, and this is one of our tenets of faith, we still believe that the God of the ancient days still heals today. Amen. There are a lot of people, you need to grab hold of, there are a lot of denominations believe that there are none of that miracles and a lot of those things don't take place today. But I'm, I'm here to tell them that my God, my God does heal today. Amen. My God heals us of all our diseases. It's not doctors. My God handles the hands of the doctors. My God gives the pharmacy people the wisdom to develop all those things. My God delivers on all the things that are necessary in the health care so that I can be cured of my diseases. Somebody once taught me this. A surgeon can take a scalpel and he can do his artwork and begin to do everything on your physical body. But after he's done everything he needs to do, something needs to be there, or someone, to mend all those wounds. 
And the only person that can do that, there's nothing in an entire medical field that has figured out how all those come together. It's a wonderful thing. And they have done a study where they said when surgeons know, and, and when patients know that people are praying for them, this is a great thing, studies. They just did off the top of their head, I, I, I'm misquoting this, but they did a study on some people that were having surgical procedures. And they said the ones that knew they were getting prayed for and the ones that didn't know they were getting prayed for, in other words, they weren't getting prayed for, the ones that got prayed for healed faster. Amen. You didn't hear that, church. Amen. Isn't that great? Amen. When you know perfect strangers are praying that God will be there to restore your physical body, not for you, but for their God, that God is glorified. God simply doesn't work. And you got to think, was that for God's glory? Of course it was. But it was all also a sign for those of us that pray. We all say this. Somehow in the back of our minds, come on, let's be honest with each other. When you pray for somebody, don't you say, I think it's because I prayed for them. <laughs> think about that. Nobody wants to admit it. You know, because we're not here to take glory for God. But doesn't it make you feel a little bit better? Yes. And I think God, and I, 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 I'm watching myself here, but I believe God wants us to pray for people, not for ourselves. But we have a hand in that. That's why he taught us to pray. Why does he tell us in the book of James, when you're sick in body, come before the elders for prayer? Amen. He teaches us the model prayer. He teaches us how we are to pray. We give glory to God, and then we petition God. And there's something about prayer. And of course, he also tells us that there is power in prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. Signs of healing. And lastly, I like to hold on to this so that everybody anticipates. I'm watching your eyes. Your eyes are bouncing to the top. Signs of truth. Verse 11, it said, The Lord said to him, and this is God speaking to Moses, because Moses has already come up with all kinds of excuses. You know, what if they don't believe me? Who should I say who sent me? What gives me the authority to do this? I can't talk. I can't speak. I don't look good. I mean, he's got all kinds of excuses. And here he goes. God tells them, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf and mute? Who gives them sight and makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go... Sounds like the Great Commission, doesn't it? Yeah. Verse 12, now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. In other words, when you think about signs of truth, and I think this is probably the most powerful thing of this whole story. All this, the little things with the staff, we think it turns to leprous and then it's restored. We think, wow, those are great things. Well, the thing was, Moses needed a mouthpiece to tell the people, the God who sent me, he told me to tell you, I am, has spoken. Not me, but God. I'm just his messenger telling you that God is going to help us, and I'm just here to tell you, follow me when God tells me, I'm your leader. He had, to, he had to go to these people to get them to trust that God had truly spoken to them. And God gave them these two incredible signs to tell them, this is how you know I was with God. The miraculous has followed me and because I'm not doing these magician tricks. I'm showing you that I've been in the presence of God. And because of the power that God has given me in the staff and the power to restore, God has truly blessed me with these incredible things. And it was something that Moses needed to tell the people. And of course, Moses is so afraid because he's saying, I can't speak to these people. I'm not a great, I'm not an eloquent speaker. Why would they even listen to me? 
And God has an answer for every excuse. And it's the same way with us. The signs of truth. I want to share with you about this so that you'll see this for what it is. Acts chapter 4. Remember Peter? Peter was one of those individuals who wasn't educated at all. Verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter, this was right after, you know, the upper room experience and all that took place. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Some people like to look at that and they like to emphasize they were unschooled and they were ordinary men. I like to emphasize that they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And it's important for us because when you're in the presence of God, God uses you for his glory. Take hold of that church. This is why God tells us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves. Because wherever the people of God are, God is in their midst. And something miraculous always takes place in the lives of his people. It could be a little singular word that God, maybe you're coming to church and you're saying, God, I need a word. I need something to encourage me throughout my week. And God speaks to you. But he doesn't speak to you just for you. He speaks to you so that you can share that truth with somebody else. This is what God is all about. It's not about just taking what God has to offer and you saying, well, I went to church. Do you ever tell your friends when you go to church and you tell your friends, you know, we had a great church service and the message came out and you share what word ministered to you. Your friends, because they're not spiritual, may not understand what you're talking about, but you could break it down to them and tell them I needed this. I needed to know that God is a God that heals. Mm -hmm. And God is personal. And God truly cares for me. Your friends need to know that. They need to hear that. Because they don't understand who God is or know who God is. But when you, an ordinary person, shares what God has done in your life, God is amazed by what you say about him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's the greatest thing in the world. You know one thing I, I love about this? They took note they had, that these men had been with Jesus. And that's the same way with those of us that are in Christ Jesus. When you testify to God's truths, your friends will know that you're a Christian. And it's about the word of God that pro proceeds from your mouth all the time. Your godly character becomes an emanate and it just comes out. Every time you talk to your friends, it's not about sports. It's not about the last second shot. It's about how God is, or what God is doing in your life. Mm -hmm. And the more and more you speak about God and how God comes from your life, not just kept inside, but shared the God that you have come to believe in, the God that you, you come to love. When this becomes to come out of you on a personal level to your friends, they'll want to have, just as I shared the story from Bill Hybels, they'll want to have what you have. you're saying, well, Pastor Ben, how do I know? How do I know I'll know what to say when the time comes? And John 14, this is Jesus as he is speaking to his disciples and telling them that I'm going to get ready to leave. And he's telling them that, but a helper, the Holy Spirit, he's called the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things. All these things that I've shared with you, all these things that I've taught you, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will remind you of all these things. I used to say to myself, how am I going to preach all these Sundays? I used to say that. But even before I became a pastor, I thought, how does Pastor Tony do this all the time? How do they do that? I mean, it's like, it's not the same message. Because you know what? If I could just speak on John 3, 16 for the rest of the year, life would be wonderful. <laughs> right? But that's not what it has to be. There has to be a preparation. 
And in the preparation over the years, I've learned that you got to give prep time to God. Because it's not about, I can just do it on a whim. I actually have to devote a certain time to say, God, I'm exclusively yours, and nothing is going to disturb me of this time. I'm just going to be committed to the word that you have given me and just keep reading it. And I'm just, every time I'm either driving, I'm walking, I'm watching something, I'm just constantly focusing on the word and asking, what little nugget do I need to grab as I'm trenching and trying to sow what God wants to hear, wants you guys to hear for that particular Sunday? This is an incredible thing how God delivers on those things. But God tells us, like I said, how did God do this? It is his Holy Spirit in you. You say, well, he could do that for you because you're a pastor. What he does for me, he'll do for you. Saying, how am I going to remember this? You just got to keep reading. That's why I always, I always will say Bible study. The more you read, the more you retain. The more you ask questions, the stronger you get. And that's part of the way it is. There's these games out there right now. Those little video games. You know what I'm talking about? Because a lot of adults here don't even know what those are, right? You just see your kids playing on them, right? But do you know that our children that play these games, they know how to manipulate the action figures or whatever they're doing. Little kids today know how to tell. I'm amazed when my nephews grab whatever the devices they have. And they're able to show me how they do what they do. Because that's the generation of today. But they know how to do it. You know how they know how to do it? From repetition. They do it all the time. And because they do it all the time, they can recall this. Because it's kind of like, you know, the Word of God, how they use the illustration of the Bible. Just like cows, when they regurgitate and they keep doing this over and over and over and over again, after a while you start quoting verses because you keep seeing them and reading them over and over again, and you're saying, Pastor Ben, you quote a lot of verses. Well, that's because I've been doing it over and over and over again. It has nothing to do with memory. It has everything to do with I just keep repeating them over and over and it becomes something, as the Bible tells us, that he will place his words in our heart. It doesn't just happen like this. The words in the Bible that you read become something in your life and you live out the word of God in your life. The prodigal son, one of the greatest parables of all, the prodigal son is me. I, I recall that because I identify with him. It comes off the page. And I know the story frontwards and backwards because I've studied it and because I've lived it. And it's the same way with everybody in the body of Christ. When the word of God becomes personal to you, then it becomes, as I just taught you, it becomes a sign of truth. It becomes something that is so evident in your own personal life. Amen. And that's what God wants us to do. Amen. As we take a look at some of the things, I'm going to go back real quick just to to uh, remind us, first and foremost, God gives us signs of faith. And in these signs of faith, he's there to enable us and to show us through the little tangible things in our lives. He allows little things to take place in our lives. They seem so insignificant, but God uses even the small things in our life to strengthen our faith. Secondly, he uses healings. Healings are there, and we, we truly believe that healings do take place in the 21st century because God as a God that heals. And of course, lastly, signs of truth. His truth is evident. And the more you regurgitate and the more you learn, the more you go to Bible study, the more you learn more about God, the more His Word will make an impact in your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you.